Hey guys, so if you're new here or if you're not, if you want to hear me voice act, head over to our main channel, links down below. And if you don't, this channel's solely for TTS. Um, if you want to know all the details about what's going on, we have a stream up that you can go and watch, but let's just get into the video. So this is another story from the Paladin DM that also goes by Lord Althory. If you like his work you should check out his subscribe star to support him directly or check out his YouTube channel linked down below. And with that out of the way let's get into the story. I am the bard, who has seen the great evil upon the land, that all those who are unworthy of the throne seek it, and all those who are worthy fear it. With their word said to the ruler of the road, the paladins go to what rest can be prepared for them. Cause Dor is restless though, and goes out to the great porch to the north, looking towards the dark mountain. Soon he senses another approaching, a familiar presence. Julian. I was wondering when you'd be out to chat. You know me too well cause. Julian remarks as he joins the dragon born by the porch, the two men staring out at the dark mountain. The moon hangs over it, and bathes it in a faint, fading light from the waning crescent. Ah, I'm near King Jules, and me prophecies near your silver tongue will change that. Ye might delude me at the very best, but our knee king and I will be. I didn't come to persuade you to do it, Julian said, smirking at Kaz's reaction. Those eyes of yours might see the hearts of men better than most, but you're not always right. No. I came to make sure you don't hesitate. What in the abyss are ye on about? You know what I mean. We need that mountain, king or no, and we will need its fire. I don't give a damn whether you're the promised king or not, if you can light that, great, if not I'll find another way. I could not care less whether you put on a crown or not but that mountain needs to be ours or we're all dead men. I need, need to remind me. You and I both know that's a lie. The two were silent for a long while, then cause door spoke. Ye take it, wouldn't ye? Of course, but I'm a nakedly ambitious megalomaniac that I'm mildly surprised you all haven't stabbed yet. Ha! Ye tempt us too often. Cause choked before going quieter. And ye are a bastard, didn't ye think I didn't ken that ye made yourself king in all but name with that constitution? Ye never set a thing up that ye couldn't control. And yet you supported it. Why? Simple really. Ye are a bastard Jules. But ye're a bastard I've seen bend every bit of power he has to aid I and those who can I aid themselves. And the kind who will haul his mangled ass back out of hell itself to make sure ye see it through to the end. The Crimson Path has too much red on it already to stop now. Julian remarked to Redley. If I stop, all of it would be for nothing. Nee laddie, it would be for those ye aid already. But how can I deny, it is a bloody path ye walk. Cause says concernedly. One and a could, but maybe the world needs bastards like ye tape pull it along. But be wary lad, be wary of getting so blinded by your better world that ye forget to protect this good one. I've seen good worlds cause, this one has too many orcs and gnolls to qualify. Too much destruction, too much chaos. Julian said with a sigh, then shook his head. It's too late and too dark to dwell on that tonight. Good night cause door, don't forget what I said. Aye laddie. I'll ne forget it, and ye ne forget what I told ye. Cause stayed there and watched the mountain until the moon had slipped behind it, and the shadow of it lay too heavy on him to bear. Then he turned and walked back to his quarters. He was sharing them with Senkit, just as they did on the road. He sighed and laid back on the bed which was, as usual, too small for him. He closed his eyes, and drifted into sleep. He was back here again, the great hall at the entrance to the hold he had called home for so long. It was the day he had left, the day his father sent him away from the lies and the treachery and the whispered words behind his back. There was just one thing standing in his way, Thorgrim Glamdring. His brother, his tormentor, his enemy. Leaving so soon Drake. The memory mocked him, like it always had. You've only just arrived and drunk all our mead, eaten all our flocks. Perhaps if we offer an elvish lass or a human princess to keep and devour we can persuade you to stay. He had never been this brazen, but Gazdor was leaving. He'd won. Get out of my way brother. Gazdor said, as he had five years ago. 
My brother is dead, killed by a dragon 24 years ago. And I will not permit a dragon to make off with our armor, our weapons, our treasure, and his name. This is my armor Thorgrim, forged by my own hands, and likewise my axes. You will take them when you take them from my cold dead hands you arrogant bastard. Brother met brother in a clash of axes as the two fell upon one another. And you never take my name. Cause Dor hissed, fire in his words. They fought, axe and shield against draconic strength and barely contained fury. This time it was different though. It had been a hard fight, one of Kaza's hardest when he left, but he had grown so, so very much since that fight. Thorgrim was weak, Thorgrim was slow, Kaz was stronger now, and he was far, far more than the child who had fled his home. He swirled around Thorgrim's defenses, smacking aside his clumsy attacks like toys. The might of dragons was in him, and Thorgrim was nothing but just another gnat to crush. He soared high on his wings and unleashed his fire down on his little, oh so little, brother. The fire burned the shield, and he came down with both axes. In the past his flame had only weakened the shield for his axes to break, but now it was mighty, and the shield turned to ash. And his brother broke instead. The song of a gong, a war drum, a conqueror's anthem rang out as Kazdor crushed his brother. The first blow tore his arm from his body, the second splattered his body across the entire hold, royal blood alighted by dragon fire. The sage's words echoed in his head as his brother's blood turned to magma. The hold began to burn, homes melting, temples burning, taverns exploding as the beer inside ignited. He turned from the destruction and saw a throne, the throne his father sat on. But his father was old, his brother was dead. That would be his throne. He looked up and saw it begin to rain, not water, but molten gold, as the great chandeliers hung from the ceiling of the hold began to melt. There will be no need for them any longer. Runes were not needed for light when all was molten and wreathed in fire. The gold rained down upon the throne, gilding it. Now it was a throne fit for a dragon prince. As he began to ascend the steps to the throne, the gold ran down into coins with his image upon them. They piled on the stairs and throughout the throne room, turning it to a proper hoard. Only one thing stood between him and his throne. A tiffling he knew very well. But even she was not enough. He could beat her, he could take her, take the throne, take the crown. He was a dragon, he was a god. Take her, take the crown, take the throne, take it all. He was strong. He deserved it. Take her, take the throne, take the crown, take it all. Because Dora woke from his nightmare gasping for breath and in a cold sweat, throwing up the covers as he did. The sun was rising and the light of it filtered through the window onto him. Senkit had just finished getting dressed, and turned to him with a concerned look on his face. Are you okay Kaz? She asked. He looked at her, then shook his head. Fine, I'm fine. He said, rubbing his eyes. Just a bad dream. Just a dream. Senkit seemed somewhat unconvinced, but she left to let him get dressed in private. Kaz rolled his legs out of his bed, looking at her as she went, then turning to look down at his hands. No, not hands. Hands were things people had. These were claws, talons, dragon's claws. The hands of kings were of healers and craftsmen, not thieves and butchers. He got dressed, the words pounding in his mind. Take her, take the throne, take the crown, take it all. I cannot be a king. He said again as he went out, he went into the dining hall, where the rest of the party was already assembled. Farron was with them too, laughing and joking with Peregrine. No, not just a dragon. Cus thought as he watched the golden dragon born. They're dragons too. They don't burn and pillage and torture and take. It's just the chromatics, just the reds. It wasn't that they were dragon's claws, it was that they were a monster's claws. He remained silent as he ate his breakfast and drank his coffee. It was clear to everyone, even Farron, that he was in a foul mood, and something hung heavily on him. But they didn't say anything. He was Kaz. He was the strongest and the stubbornest of them, by some measures the best of them. If a foul mood and a foul sleep was on him it would pass away. 
because he was Kazdor the Paladin, wasn't he? I am the Bard, keeper of stories and of the story, that they might not be forgotten, but told anew and anew from generation to generation. From the gate of the road, the last city, the Paladins ride. At their head is Kazdor, and alongside him Farron, both astride their mighty boars. At their left hand rides Julian and the Ort, and on their right rides Senkit and Dundry. Order undivided rides for the shadowed mountain. They ride along what was once called the Golden Road in days long past, when the dwarves of Draken feasted and the dragons of Ferrode were friends, and their friendship brought with it great prosperity. But now the road is old, ill maintained. Once there were milestones capped with gold to mark the way, but those have all been stolen. On the first day, they ride far, until the hill upon which Ferrode sits is small and its light seems like a low lying star on the horizon. Opposite it, the mountain rises high into the night, cutting off the light of the stars. The moon is gone, hidden and new, and darkness lies heavy upon the land. Once more, for the first time in months actually, Senkit and Dundry look out onto the edge of sight and see there the black vines, pulsing darkly with unholy life once again. The blight lies heavy upon the darkened mountain. The fire stays lit all throughout the night. The next day, as they rise they look to the east, where Indigastern clouds are gathering. Elaktum is on the move, and working his terrible magic. Even now, as the souls of the Iladrine are dragged down and twisted into new soldiers for his army, his vile presence brings a sickness upon the land. Across the land, and upon another plain even, Elaktum looks to the west. From the throne of living flesh he has twisted the inhabitants of a nearby village into he sits and ponders. The tormented palanquin turns laboriously at a subtle urging of his will towards a certain depression he had the mains dig out. The small pool is beginning to fill with blood from the various captives, and while normally he would sit and wait for them to be drained slowly and painfully, he does not have that kind of time. With a flick of his mind he sends an order. The demons fall upon the captives and tear the heads from their bodies, limbs from sockets, and rip them apart. The steady rivers of blood become a cascade, quickly filling the pool. Elaktham waited a few moments more for the pool of blood to still, then raised the hand. The pool shimmered, becoming a mirror onto another world, and a certain elf many days away. Andri was on the move, and her companions with her. There was another dragon with them now, interesting. He panned back farther and his eyebrows raised slightly in interest. He had not expected to find them running at a volcano of all the things. Still, he knew there must be a reason, some weapon that could harm him, a sanctuary where they might stand and resist him. He was a mighty midge, but even he couldn't knock over a mountain. He frowned. If they did fortify, it would prove irritating. Not dangerous mind you, he was far too strong, his army too great and terrible to be resisted. But the cost would be high, and the ones he sought to slay were too righteous or too ordered for him to claim their souls. It could lead his army, and delay or perhaps even prevent him from turning southwards and bringing yet further destruction in the civilized lands. No, this could not be allowed. He sighed and turned back to the walls of Elva Karen. The siege was going well, but it would need his direct supervision. The suzerain was a wily foe, and his infiltrations had all failed. Now it would come to magic and might, and they would slaughter their way into the city. He would be needed. He turned back to the pool. As much as he would have enjoyed dealing with them personally, it simply wasn't within his time. So, a lackey then. He leaned back and considered, then remembered the captain he had gotten a hold of not too long ago. Yes, he would serve as a good base. He turned to go and work his magic, leaving behind the blood pool. A few moments later, wretched mains began to pull themselves out of the pool, the last remnants of the slain prisoners. Elaktum frowned as he looked upon the soul in his hands. It was weaker than expected for one who had managed to slay a Batesia. Oh well, luck does factor in occasionally. Still, this wouldn't be enough, not nearly enough. He turned his gaze back to the city, to the high spires the inhabitants clustered in. He selected a slightly smaller one and snapped his fingers. Out of the sky he tore the stars from where they hid in the day and cast them down onto the earth. Dozens smashed into the side of the spire, weakening it, it began to sway as great holes were blasted into it, 
but still the magic woven into its construction would not let it fall just yet. So Elatham reached out and undid that magic, only for a moment. A moment was all it took though for the tower to crumble, and the magic holding it up could not reassert itself quickly enough. The tower fell, and a great dust cloud went up throughout all the city and spilled out over the walls. Thousands died and were dying, crushed by rubble, burned by the falling stars, and run through with shrapnel. That would do, it was an inefficient way really. There was suffering and terror and sorrow and horror, but not the kind he would truly harvest when he finally took the city and every last one of its inhabitants. Still, a thousand souls is a thousand souls, and that's useful for something. He turned and wove them together, stitched the screaming damned onto the stronger soul of the captain, and poured his magic and essence into it. He gave the dark power a form, and as it rose before him in all its terrible glory, he smiled. He was a god of destruction, but when he chose to create, it was very good in his eyes. Go and kill the paladins. He told his monster, and it left. He smiled. That would hopefully solve that problem. Hopefully. The paladins rode on, aware of Elatham's wickedness, but blissfully ignorant of exactly what he was doing. Around the fourth hour afternoon, they came to a great bridge, which spanned the Celsistian, the mighty river that ran from San Jonas. It was a strange bridge, for it was a combination of dwarven stonework and living wood. At its midpoint stood two tall trees, though no leaves were upon them, and their branches were thin and strangled. For this bridge was old, older still than the hold and the clans that had made it. It was a true relic of the ancient world, before dwarves and elves had grown their animosity towards one another. As sturdy as dwarven stone, and with the long life of the ancients, it had endured many kingdoms and their many falls, and even as Blight sank its talons into it, it remained. For the strength of the dwarves and the wisdom of the elves was in it, and such a thing does not diminish easily. The party began to ride forwards, but Farron called a halt. Were ye? The sun falls, and darkness shall soon be on the land. It would be folly to rest this night in the shadow of the mountain. For there the darkness is greatest, and the shadow walks upon the world freely. And the party heeded him, and stopped early that day. It was still bright, and the golden hour was just beginning to dawn as the sun began its descent into the west. So, the paladins went down to the beach, for it was very near. They made their camp there, above where the tide would be the highest, and rested a little while on the warm sands. After a little while, Farron sat up, took off his armor, set aside his sword, and picked up his spear, which was a long fishing harpoon. I'm going for a swim, see if I can catch something for dinner. He said and started walking towards the waves. Andre watched him go, and noted there was another spear lying nearby. Well I may as well. I haven't had a good swim in a while. She said and also removed her armor and took up the spear. Julian looked up briefly from his book just long enough to watch her stride into the waves before shaking his head and very pointedly burying his nose back in said book. Eeyore chuckled slightly as he started arranging the evening's fire. So, you aren't a eunuch Giles, I was starting to wonder. Eeyore. Julian said quietly. I can and will smite you halfway back to the road. Eeyore just continued to chuckle softly. Well you haven't denied it. I have better things to do with my day than waste my time chasing women like some spoony bard. I'm arguably the most powerful person in the area politically. If I wanted women I could have them. Julian responded. Or you've got bast if you really need to your crude joke was cut off by Julian's gauntleted fist hitting him in the nose and blasting him back across the beach. It was accompanied by a surge of crimson energy that threw up sand all about. Eort himself ploughed a trench several meters long before he came to a stop chuckling. Julian turned back to the somewhat bemused Senkitunga's door. He deserved it. He explained as Eort got back up and wiped the blood from his nose, healing the relatively minor damage. As for Bast herself she was in one of the tents, furiously working to clear it of any and all sand. Sand, water, salt. I hate the beach. She grumbled as she continued to try in vain to remove all the particles from her dwelling. Eort got the rest of the firewood and then decided to join Peregrine in hunting through the tide pools and searching them for shellfish rather than continuing to harass Julian. 
As for Senankas, the two just sat and watched the waves next to one another, because Dor's eyes inevitably wandered towards the mountain. His heart skipped a beat as he felt Senkit's hand on his shoulder. He turned to her and saw her looking concernedly at him. Don't worry. It's just another monster to fight. She encouraged him. It's not that dragon that scares me. He told her in Dwarvish. It's what comes after. I know. She said, and for a moment he thought she really did, but then she spoke again. It ate him strong, stronger than anything we've ever faced by far. But we've beaten everything else. We'll beat him too. Of course, of course we will. Kuz said, words trailing off. He took Senkit's hand in his and they looked out at the sunset together. She drew near to him. He wanted to put his arm out, put it around her and draw her close. He wanted to bring her near and tell her. But no. That would be to give in, to give another step towards taking, seizing what he wanted. He could never go near that path, never even look down it and wonder, or that would be the end. Take the crown, take the throne, take her the voice of his dragon's blood echoed in his mind. Never. He swore against it, as he had sworn so many times before. Cause door so late as his heart and his mind and his flesh walled against one another. Here he sat in peace, on the end of a beautiful day unable to enjoy it. Here he stood on the brink of battle with a terrible evil and not one thought was concerned for it. How petty he was, he thought to himself. But it is the petty things like love that make the world what it is. That make us great and damn us also. Their every was somewhat interrupted by Andri re-emerging from the ocean, a sight which made both Sen and Kuz turn slightly redder than they already were. Sen, come on and have a swim, the water's fine. She encouraged. In case you've forgotten, I have hooves. Sen pointed out, lifting one of her legs to emphasize her point. I hate swimming, and any water that gets over my head. Besides, my homeland has pleasure sores. Andri laughed and turned back to her fishing. By the time night had fallen, the party was gathered around a newly roaring fire, laughing and drinking together as the fish Andri and mostly Farron had caught. They were merry, but not too merry. All could see the darkness waiting at the edges of the light, waiting for it to die. Except Julian, who as he could not see the clearly evil black vines of evil waiting out there in the dark handle firewood. Why can't he see them? Farron asked, and Senkit shrugged. We've been asking this since we got here. It's probably the influence of the Shadow Fell, but for some reason he's blind to it. Could be the fact that he's from another plane. Peregrine mentioned. Something strange in his blood because of it. I don't think it's that. Yort said uncomfortably as he shifted somewhat closer to the fire. I wasn't able to see them until recently, but I could always at least sense them. He's completely oblivious. They don't seem to bother him either. Andri said, thinking on the matter. I mean they don't affect us when we walk on them but they've infested everything else in the land, to the point where they actually can be seen where the taint is strongest. Well he is a paladin. Farron said with a shrug. I suppose his god protects him. The rest of the paladins went quiet for a moment. Julian has no gods. In fact he sort of seems to hate them. Peregrine said at length. At least if the way he's treating every enemy cleric we've come across is any indication. Wait, he's a godless heretic and also a paladin? Farron asked, somewhat stunned. How does that work? He's powered by sheer bullheadedness, a heavy dose of remarkable willpower, and an absolutely titanic amount of pride. Senkit responded somewhat uncharitably. He should have been a wizard. And his pet cat's a devil. Cause Dor mentioned offhandedly. By Aetherite. The pet cat devil shouted from her tent where she was still hiding from the sand. Farron looked around at the paladins in utter bewilderment. Why in the name of any god who is listening do you hang out with this person and how have you not stabbed him yet? Andri chuckled. Honestly, your question makes sense. But as much of a godless fool as Julian can be, he's undoubtedly a hero. You never meet a man with more fire and determination for people. The reason he's such a bastard is because he quite simply doesn't care what anyone else thinks of him, man or god, so long as he helps people. He'll do whatever it takes to try to protect and aid anyone and everyone he can, 
and he'll fight like a devil to make the world as he thinks it should be. Aye, he's a bastard, but as bastards go there's none nobler. Kaz says with a grin. You do know I can hear everything you say through Bast, right? Julian said as he returned from gathering more wood. Yes. Nor do I care. Senkit said as she chewed her fish. I'm rubbing off on you after all this time Saint Julian responded coolly as he deposited the logs. Eort opened his mouth to say something, then thought better of it and shut it. Farron looked around at the party and shrugged. You are all insane. Eort laughed. I said the same thing when I met them and look at me now. We'll have a seventh member at this rate. Well I would at least stay and brand. Farron, Oath of the Crown, said with a grin. But I have a city of my own to protect. They continued their conversation and meal until it was finished, and then went to sleep. They set watches in pairs, and Farron and Julian's watch fell on the witching hour. As the two stood their silent vigil, they heard a creaking, cracking sound from up above. Julian peered into the dark and then groaned. The two withered trees from the bridge were up, walking, and heading their direction. You could have mentioned the trees occasionally get up to murder things. He told the dragonborn as he reached for his sword. I would have, had I known. Farron responded. To arms. Order to arms. A black knight, for the foe is upon us. He shouted, rousing the rest of the pair as the tree blights approached. He drew forth his flamberge, and it came alight with silver fire that burned the dark vines with a pure light. The vines withered away beneath the holy light of the mitral flame, and blackened with the scent of brimstone under the sulfuric light of Eye of Terror, Ilabath Arshan, mitral flame of the West. Long has it stood against the dark, since ages past when my forefathers held thee. The light of the two hills burns eternal. He roared a battle cry, Eye of Terror. A flaming sword that kills things very well. Julian answered him sarcastically. And to the nine hells with battle cries. No tabletop RPG is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us. If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm. Only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimashi Wizards the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter. Also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Belle Delphine, the succubus that has poisoned the town's well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below but let's get back to the video. I am the bard, who knows the great heresy against the story, that the truth which is inconvenient is drowned in convenient lies, or cast aside into the deep where it is forgotten. Such is the truth that once, in ages before the machinations of cunning men and the pride of old fools tore the world asunder, elves and dwarves stood together as friends. Upon the golden road there once stood a bridge, of dwarven stone and elven trees. But even this fades, for all shall diminish. Though usually, diminish does not mean create a pair of angry blightons that seek to smash anything that gets too close. But there is a time for everything, and the world is wide and filled with many wonders. Not that either Julian or Farron would know this as the two blights stormed towards them, their footsteps throwing up sand, shaking the ground, and filling the air with the sound of thunder. The tide pools shook as the blights let out a sickly, wet bellow like an elephant with laryngitis. I shall take the left, thou withstand the right. Farron said as he split off to intercept one. We don't need to beat them, just distract them long enough for the rest of the party to get up, don't do anything stupid. Julian warned him, but nodded and broke left. There was very little left of the once nobolents that warded the bridge, their minds almost completely gone to the strangling blight, but they did remember this. They hated fire, and two sources of it were charging right at them. As they broke, each one split off to deal with one in particular. Julian dove into a roll as the first great limb smashed into the sand next to him, throwing up a wave of grit. He rolled to his feet in time to dodge under the blight's legs as it raised a great foot to stomp him. He swung his mighty blade into the ant's ankle, biting and bearing, but the stubborn wood and rubbery blight was strong. He swung again putting his back into it like a lumberjack and it still would not cut through, instead becoming stuck in the tree trunk limb. Farron did not dodge the swing of the mighty ant, but rather deflected it. 
He swung out and blackened branch met Mighty Mitchell in a shower of sparks and fire. The second arm came in low and he stepped out from under the first and inside the Ent's reach. Raising his arms to their fullest height he brought Mitchell flame down and cut off the Ent's left kneecap. Cause door was swiftest in awakening, for Sivrid did not slumber lightly. Noting the danger, he took up one axe, and grabbed Peregrine by the nape in another hand. The halfling had just enough time to grab his swords before the dragonborn took flight. He saw past the one fighting Farron, throwing Peregrine onto it. Then, the dragon prince hit the one facing Julian in the face both feet and axe first, making the creature bend backwards like an aspen in the storm as 700 pounds of angry fiery breather hit him it in the face. As for Peregrine, he went flying past the imp's face, but turned and drove both his blades into the side of its head to stop himself. The imp roared in pain as the flaming swords dug into it, reeling back in agony. Peregrine pulled out one sword and drove it into the imp's shoulder, using it as a hook to pull himself up. Andre dove for her bow, rolling upright into a crouching position, touching a finger to one as she imbued it with an almost heretical smite. Swift death to my enemies. She whispered her prayer. And may the tree god forgive me. She loosed her crimson arrow into the twilight. The arrow struck a treant in the chest and exploded in scorching fire from the tip outwards. The undeer dried back and forth, almost throwing his door off as the flames consumed its rotting, vine-infested organs. The ant swung wildly as the flames consumed it, striking his door in the side. The dragonborn flew out like a rag doll, nearly flying clear of the monster but his axe held firm and let him keep his grip, albeit weakly. The blow had struck his ribs and shattered everyone on his left side, leaving his vision blurry as the other hand reached out to crush him. It was intercepted though, as Julian ignited his wings and soared upwards, smashing into the outstretched palm in a glow of brimstone and crimson will. The hand pulled back, several fingers falling uselessly to the ground before Julian dropped his wings and fell, Eye of Terror coming down in a dread arc. The sand flew back in a crater for meters as Julian delivered his smite into the creature's arm, completely severing it. The boom of the impact was swiftly echoed by the faint thud of the Ent's arm hitting the beach. The noise roused Kazdor back to his senses and he swung himself back upwards. Gripping the empty eye socket of the tree in one hand he struck it across the face with his axe. The rotten wood exploded off, revealing the writhing, festering darkness puppeteering the tree. Dragonfire lit the night and burned away the darkness. Meanwhile, the other tree was proving slightly more of a problem. Peregrine warded off the claw reaching for him, only for the blight within the tree to erupt from it, spewing forth like dark sap to seize him and hurl him off, covered in a suffocating black tar. Senkit, who had been slowed by finding her shield for the sand had blown over it, rushed to his side, placing a hand at the corruption she channeled her power and burned it away in golden flames. Peregrine gasped for breath and vomited up the black sludge before coming uneasily to his feet. Eort rushed past them with a javelin in hand. He placed the blunt end into the sand and pole vaulted into the air, hurling the javelin like Olympian lightning into the monster's throat. Thunder cracked across its body and he raised both hands to catch onto it and pull himself up. Unfortunately, whatever curse had been placed on Eort and his weapons still remained, and the javelin snapped, dropping him to the ground and knocking the wind from his lungs. Farron, who had been hacking away at the monster's legs pulled the hobgoblin away before the blight could crush him underfoot, then rose and interposed the tip of his sword between himself and the oncoming oaken fist. The blow hit him and his sword square on, pasting him into the ground, but the flaming blade sunk deep, and Farron held on stubbornly. The ant raised its fist and shook it skywards, dialoging the painful blade and throwing Farron into the heavens. The Prince of Farrowed saw sky and earth spin around and around sickenly, then hit the ground and saw no more. Peregrine and Senkit rushed forwards as the ant did this, she dropping back and raising her shield above her head. Peregrine leapt onto it, and she propelled him upwards as he leapt back onto the ant and drove his flaming blades into the side of its throat. Meanwhile there were repeated cracks as Senkit slammed her morning star into the monster's legs over and over again. Eort rushed to Farron's side and helped the dragonborn back to his feet with some healing magic. Fight's not over yet. Get up. He encouraged him. 
Farron rose, shaking his head to clear it of the ringing. He saw the wounds Peregrine had inflicted on the Blight's throat, then turned to Eort. Dost thou have any more javelins? The Blight kicked Senkit back and threw off Peregrine, though this time Sen was able to catch him and both landed on their feet. The Blight took a step forwards, and turned at a strange sound. Farron, screaming like a maniac to get the Blight's attention, was charging it with a javelin in both hands. The Blight turned to crush him, sweeping out a long arm. He planted his spear in the ground and flung himself, much as how he ought had done. He didn't get nearly as much height, but it was enough for him to land on the sweeping limb and from there leap up yet again, drawing forth the mitral blade as he did. Worm it now you throw denial to Jindas Vedrave Thirtyr Iulirith. The light is most brilliant when night is near. Thus he cried as he called upon his smite. The brilliant light of sunset, in gold and red and all the many colors of the last hour shone upon his blade as he delivered it to the wound Peregrine had already wrought. There was a flash that left all who saw it blinder for a moment, and then Farron fell, landing on one knee. A massive golden glowing wound lit the night like a bonfire, streaming from the remnant of a blow that tore the Blight's head from its body. The tree fell with a crash onto the ground and moved no more. Julian and the recently healed Kazdor moved over to examine the corpse and aid in healing the wounded. Flashy, unnecessarily wordy, and a waste of yet another good javelin. Julian said as he looked at Farron's handiwork. I think you're going to fit in just fine. Welcome to Order Undivided. The next day, when the party had recovered from the night's battle, they set out to cross the bridge. Peregrine stopped and noted the space where the trees had once stood. There were now the hints of small saplings growing there, green and uncorrupted. He smiled. There was indeed great evil in the world, but it shall not endure forever, and while it would take many years, the glory of the old would be restored. The party rode across once more towards the great mountain, along the road which ran straight towards it. As they passed over the bridge they saw the remnants of what had been a small river dock town, and the ruins of what might have once been a rather prosperous village near where the river met the sea. Oi, Farron. Do ye ken what this once was? Kazdor asked the gold dragon born as they rode past it. Indeed. Hear now the tales upon which this land is founded, and of the doings of the great and of the small across it. In ages long past when Farod was young, and the high hall atop its peak had just been built and my people were learning the ways of farming, and the great king was still building Drake in Feastin into its glory, the city of San Jonas was still the greatest city in the land, for the conqueror had left it mostly intact. With the blessings of the gods that grant us this eternal summer, it came to pass that the fields were always bountiful, for as soon as the field was harvested it could be planted up again. By this, the land produced greater bounty than anywhere in the north, and men and wharves came up from the south to buy it. But the roads through the mountains are long and treacherous, and the paths narrow. It would have taken too much labor and too many men to tame them and make a safe and wide highway by land to the distant south. So it went that men came by sea instead, and traded with us. And the dragons of Farod kept the seas safe as far as the high north, such that the land came to be called the Golden Coast, our birthright and our duty. Hang on one moment. Julian said as they continued. How in the Nine Hells did anyone make it through the ice sheets of the north? I know it's warm enough here but there's a bit of a small problem of the ocean freezing between here and the rest of the civilized world. Indeed. Had it remained so, then we never would have accomplished anything more than simple farming, but this was known to the wise men of the past. The dwarves of Draken Feastin and the great magi of the humans worked together, for the dwarves were skilled in strange magics. At this Kazdor's eyebrows shot up. Dwarves that were known for their skill in magic? Perhaps he simply meant they had a great many priests, but if not, that was a strange thing indeed. But he did not interrupt. He would know enough when they came to the mountain. And so, by their wisdom and their knowledge of the arcane, they built a great device and beacon and drake in feasting, to tame the mountain and to open the way to the south. The device drained away the heat of the mountain so that it would not erupt, and instead channeled it by arcane means to open a passageway into the south. And so, it came to pass that by the seas trade came to the lands. And the trade was accepted at two major ports, 
the first and most prosperous being my home in Therode, and the second being this port, which the halflings ruled. It was prosperous because there are pearls to be found in the waters nearby. That and a halfling feast is worth sailing another day or so. And so it came to be that the town prospered, but it was too near the blight when it fell upon the land, and the little folk were turned all to ashes at the coming of the walking blight and the darkening of the mountain. Thus, was the village brought to an end, and its name has been cast into darkness. Are we entirely certain he isn't just a bard who happens to have a modicum of self-control? Senkit asked as they rode on. No, Sturai keeping is a long tradition of my people, since before we came to the hill of Farod. Hear now the tale upon which the tradition is founded. In ages long past, my people lived in a great city, and its name has been lost to the past, though its legacy is not forgotten. It was a city of the first empire, Arkhosia, the first and last great empire of the dragons and their beloved, and the first kingdom, as our great father Sargon made it, in the days before Io departed, when Bahamut and Shamat were young and as friendly as any siblings can be. But all must diminish, and Arkhosia too was cast down near the dawning of the world as Io passed, and Bahamut and Shamat made their great war upon each other, drowning the world in bloodshed as all the nations were consumed by civil war. Thus began the age of mortals, as men channeled the power of magic for the first time, and cast down the dragons. For many generations we wandered, establishing cities only for them to be destroyed, and on and on this continued for the entire age. Then the arrogance of man cast them down in turn, as the greatest of their magi enacted a spell of the thirteenth tier, seeking to become a god. All he did was drain the lives of men and cut them short forever after. And the empire fell, and with it all knowledge and learning that was written down was destroyed. Nisica. Julian said quietly, as one in mourning. The greatest of all cities, cast down by the jealous gods, because they could not stomach the thought that mortals might become their equals. Tharon continued. And so, my people continued their wandering, and the world was filled with disaster and torment, and the dwarves and elves made war upon each other, and wherever we went was cast down. And whatever was written down was destroyed and forgotten. So, it came to pass that one ancestor, many years before we came to the hill of the road, broke from his plan and forsook writing and reading also. Instead he would tell all knowledge and pass it down by speaking from generation to generation, so that when they were driven from their homes and cast aside, they would not forget what had happened. And so, it came to be that this continued onwards, with each chief passing down the histories of the ages, and all the workings and doings of our forefathers, until my father passed it down to me, and I in turn shall deliver it to my son or daughter. Wait, you've seriously kept an oral history of your people since the War of Vengeance? Julian said, somewhat awestruck. You people should have been wizards. Senkin snorted. Giles, only you would answer a gift like this with more magic. Of course I would. The stories will have pay weight. We're here. Kazdor said quietly as they looked up the road. Before them stood a mountain, and set into its side was a mighty gate with stone doors shut fast, flanked by two statues of mighty dwarves wielding axes and hammers. Drakin feasting. I am the bard, who has witnessed the greatest of all heresies against the story, that men will willfully forget that which has happened, and in doing so seek to destroy the past and make a fiction of it. Bard and four-eyed trickster, I may be, but I have never written down anything that did not have certain truths in it, and I do not record histories as they should have occurred, or else Ascalone would never have been, and this tale would end with a wedding and a triumph. Among these many truths is the truth of fear, fear of destiny and of the fate which lies before men, which all know, and now may know, until it is too late to escape it. This is the fear that dried Kazdor's mouth and set his hands quivering as he stood before the gates of the shadowed hold. The gate was shut and could not be opened. The doors were carved of stone, such that only by magic or by the might of many titans could they be moved. They towered thirty feet high and twenty feet across each, such that the full span of the gateway was forty feet across. Julian looked up at the doors, then turned to Farron. I hope your stories include a convenient back door or we're going to be leaping into a volcano, or be it an extinct one. Dinny worry yourself laddie. We only need to speak the password and the gates will open.
Who's left to open them? Julian asked. The gates old oven holds any moved by man or machine laddie, but by ancient and runic magic. We may need be the sparkling fairies o the elves, and need make for ourselves many sorcerers o wizards, but our magic is strong, and woven into the worlds we make for ourselves. Farron, do ye ken the name o the clan that held this place? No, their name has been lost to shadow. Once we too held the words to open the hold, but this too was diminished. The dragonborn answered sadly. This is why you write things down. Julian poked, and Farron snarled at him. Enough, the both o ye. Give me a wee moment and I'll have it. He said, and he sat down, crossed his legs, and began to meditate. He ought cocked an eyebrow at this. So, his solution is to become a monk and teleport inside. No, I don't think so. Andre said as she studied him, flicking back through her own memories of him. He mentioned he's memorized the entirety of the list of Dwarven grudges, it's possible he memorized the list of holds and their various passwords as well. Ah, so he's undergoing something sort of like your trance then un. Peregrine said curiously. The elf nodded, and Peregrine chuckled. Well, it seems the sons of Maradon and daughters of Karelin may yet have more in common than one would think. If he's looking through a history and a list that long we might be here for a while. Julian said and he took a seat himself, leaning up against the door and opening his book. He and Andre shared a look and then the two got up and stepped away from the group before sitting down and beginning to talk in low tones. Curious, Eort slipped under invisibility and carefully snuck towards the speaking pair to watch them. He could hear them speaking, but they were speaking Elvish and he could not understand it. They had many strange sigils and pages of occult texts before them, and they were comparing various notes, approaches, and runes of their own. He slipped back to the party and dropped his cloak. Well, I have no idea what the hells they're doing, but I don't think he's trying to seduce her unless there is something merely disturbing going on in their bedrooms. Sank it fascipalmed. Eort, why do you immediately jump to such base and crass humor? Because unlike you I've sworn no oaths of celibacy and thus I'm allowed to have some fun, a family, and possibly a sizable harem assuming I acquire enough loot and power. You are mildly disgusting. Senkit responded. I'm a hobgoblin, and I'm honest. I at least admit that I'd like to have a bride and family one of these days when we're done delving into various horrible places. He said with crossed arms. Why does that sound vaguely accusatory? Because I have eyes to see and I can't tell you and cause he ought shut up as he felt a sudden warmth and the scent of brimstone beginning to arise in his pants, then sighs. Paladins, so damn pure they can't be honest. You're fools, the both of you. There was a brief moment of screaming before Eort successfully planted his blazing ass in the nearby ocean to extinguish himself. You have no sense of humor. He grumbled as he walked back up the beach. Oh, I do. Senkit said coolly. I personally found that very funny. That's not a sense of humor that's called being a sadist. One is normal the other is a mental disorder. I'm fairly certain we could qualify your lechery as a disorder. I'm not lecherous I'm perfectly normal, you just happen to be a nun with daddy issues and a seriously bent self image. Ye all are near very good environment for trying to read through a list several hundred pages long. Cause grumbled at them, and they fell silent. Furthermore, the need for silence kept the ought from being set ablaze for the second time that day. After approximately four hours, Kazdor rose, looking quite grave. What's wrong? Senkit asked, and he answered her in Dwarvish. Senkit, what I say is for your ears alone, for it is a secret for Dwarven princes and only the most trusted of dwarf friends. Within each hold, in hidden chambers, there are three books. The first is the Book of the Past, which records all our histories and all the grudges and wrongs done to us and by whom, as far back as the Great War with the Elves. The second book is the Book of the Present, which details the full list of the holds which yet remain, and those which have passed away into shadow. Here also are the words that will open their gates, written in magic so that any who read them who are not of the line of a king shall be struck blind, deaf, and mute. Thirdly is written the Book of Dreams, of the future and of prophecies. In it the king writes down all that which cannot yet be made, and all that which he knows shall come to pass, including his own death, 
which is made known to him. These three books are kept secret and sacred, and the princes of Ahold memorize all three, until we can recite the whole of all of them. This hold has no record. Wait, what do you mean it has no record? I mean there is no record of a hold called Drake in Feastin, and no record of any clan that claimed such a place. All the records we have of holds in volcanoes come from Chalt, or so long in the past that the volcano is now extinct. So, there's no password? Yes, and that is far from the strangest and the worst of it. Don't leave me hanging now. The dwarves are folk with long memories, we do not forget, and we do not forgive. Not the dragons for our closure or the elves for the war of vengeance, though those are so far in the past that they may as well be purely myth and legend. Only a truly great catastrophe, such as when Grumsh slew the name of the first hold can make us forget if we do not want to. So, just how terrible a thing would have had to happen here for it to not be recorded. That's only when it's lost lass. The alternative is that the hold was erased, that they enacted some heresy so great that their records were struck from our histories. But such a thing would have surely brought every clan within a thousand miles down to burn this place to rubble. So, what do you think? I don't know, but there is something strange about this hold, something we are missing about the dwarves who lived here. There's no telling what awaits us inside, but that's somewhat beside the point. Cuz switched back to common. There's knee password that were written down. We'll need another way in. Julian looked up the sheer incline of the mountain, more of a cliff face in parts than a slope. Well cuz, I hope you stretched this morning, we're going to need to fly up and I don't think I can manage more than one trip while carrying people. Bad idea. You're counted. There is still something that at least resembles a dragon around here and if it attacks us while we're flying, we're sitting ducks. Find another way in then, maybe a water intake or outtake. Andre asked and Gus shook his head. There are need be an outtake, they're sitting on a volcano, you can just throw any waste in there and it'll burn itself up and be done like smoke out the top. As for an intake, it would probably come from an underground offshoot of the river, Tay long for a stay swim. I don't suppose we could just find a window to smash in. Peregrim mentioned, and then Julian and Kuz door stopped, looked at one another, and Fassi palmed. I'll go and check for that. Kuz door began to fly around the side of the mountain and spotted a window, surprisingly low at only 20 feet above the ground. He flew near and could not see through it, for the glass was not particularly clear, and that was before a few centuries of dust had settled on it. Still, it was a way in one even he could squeeze through. He flew back down and reported it. The window was even more conveniently placed on a sort of slope that meant it wasn't completely impossible to clamber up, especially not after Kaz door let down a rope. Once they arrived, Peregrine tried his hand at picking the lock, and when that failed, Kaz door simply smashed the glass and clambered through. As their feet hit the ground and the shattered glass crunched under their boots, the musk of ages hit them like a wave. The air was incredibly stale, and they choked as their entry swept up clouds of dust. Andre wetted rags and they placed them over their mouths and noses to keep out the dust. The room they were in was small, and almost totally empty. Any furniture or furnishings that had once been in here had long since rotted away to nothing but more dust. They checked the ceiling and found no lantern or light there either. So, Julian lit his sword. Amid the swirling clouds of dust catching the indigo light of Eye of Terror like mist above a swamp they spotted their door. Farron moved forwards and pulled at the handle. The door did not move, but they all heard a click and their instincts kicked in. Down. Andre shouted, moments before a sound like thunder roaring came from all around them, like several dozen massive snare drums had been struck with a gong mallet. The paladins were all at least halfway to the ground before the air was filled with strange black smoke that smelled like some alchemist's explosive mistake. There was ringing and sparks from Senkit and Peregrine as something rang off their armor, clattering as similar something struck the opposite walls, and wet thunks as they slammed into the other paladins. One went straight through Andre's chain mail and out the other side of the elf, throwing her to the floor. Julian toppled over as one went through the plates on his shoulder and buried itself in him. Eort, by some miracle remained unscathed, and Kazdor and Farron's scale stopped the projectiles from being any further than flesh wounds. As the shock wore off, 
Julian raised a hand to first mend the tunnel that had just been made through Andre's abdomen, then turned and laid his hand on his own shoulder. He winced as the magic forced the projectile out and it dropped to the floor. It was a small thing, a rounded sphere of metal rather badly dented by its passage through his armor. What in the Nine Hells was that? Eort coughed through the smoke. Smells like blasting powder Tami. This must have been a bloody trap room tailor in fools. Blasting powder. Doesn't that stuff go off if you look at it funny? How would you use it in a trap without blowing yourself to kingdom come? Peregrine said as he waved away the dust and the black smoke. Ah Denny Ken, maybe they found a more stable variety? Kuz grumbled. Not sure, look at this. Julian said as he held up the ball. Kuz Dor took it and examined it, sniffed it, and then gave it a lick. Looks like a sling bullet the wee folk use, but it's a stronger alloy, less lead, more steel. Would be too bloody heavy for any laddie to swing. Hush. Andre ordered, and they did. She placed her ear to the floor and heard mechanisms moving in the walls. Whatever it is, it's resetting. We need to get out of this room now. Can't you burn the door? Knee without risking blowing us all tasty gel and back. Blasting powder is sensitive enough to heat that hour can I get so much as a bad mood around it without it going off. Then I'll deal with it. Julian said as he stood up and placed a hand to the door. Crimson willpower flared and blasted the sturdy door off its hinges. The paladin stepped through, staying close by and on edge. They had made it into Drake in feasting. Time would tell if they would all be making it back out. I am the bard, who has seen the glory of all that once was, and has seen it diminish. Once, Drake in feasting was the pride and glory of the summer lands, the beacon and stalwart defender of the light in the north, but now naught but dust and shadow remains. And also the dead. Once the sentries, given eyes like those of eagles would have swept up and down the dwarven hills to spy out any threat and any evil. But where are those guardians now? The light of the north is burnt out. The throne wrapped in ash, their legacy forgotten. And a great evil stalks across the land. Boldly and openly it has run, from far Elva Karan, across the breadth of the land it goes. It does not tire, it does not hunger nor thirst. None dare to oppose its passing, and it runs like a plague wind. Elakham's executioner crested the slope of the final hill between itself and the long plains leading down to the Enshaden mountain. It could still see its prey, watching them in its mind's eye as they walked down the dusty corridors of the ancient Dwarven hold. It ran on. It was getting closer. And they could not get out. The party moved as one through the dusty and darkened halls, not knowing where they were going, but knowing what they must find. The dark heart, which even now they could hear throbbing through the walls. Just as with the corruption of their own chapel, that Blight had taken for itself a champion, the dragon for road. If there was to be any hope, the dragon must be destroyed. They traveled onwards into the dark. Julian led the way, with the orc beside him. Senkit, Peregrine, Anker's door walked down the middle, with Andre and Farron taking up the rear. The flames of Hell and the Pura Mitral lit their journey in the dark. Initially, they had planned on sending Yort out ahead under cover of invisibility, but having walked into a most deadly trap on their arrival, they opted instead for safety in numbers. So, cuz, you're the only one with experience in dwarf holds, where in the abyss are we? Yort asked as he scanned the dark warily. The place was infested with the dark vines, but they pulled back always before the light. The hobgoblin was nervous. He was underground, lost, and had very little idea whether or not he could get out if it came to that. Kuz door turned to a wall and brushed away the dust to examine it. There were runes there, carved into the stone and outliving the dwarves who carved them. It was in the 104th year of King Asvadil Greybeard that the giants came out of the north on great longship sand. We're still in the outer hold, the drake will probably be in the inner hold, nearer to the treasure and the flames. He responded, and they kept moving. His face furrowed as he pondered. You haven't heard of a clan greybeard, have you? Senkit asked him, slipping into Dwarvish as the two walked quietly alongside one another. No. Kuz said quietly. It makes sense though I suppose. Farron mentioned they were magi, and the greybeards are the wisest and oldest of our kin. He said, though his voice was bitter. 
I take it you were not over much fond of their wisdom? More their glares, and their barely hidden smirks as I left. Cuz growled, the air around him warming slightly. Never enough for the old fools. Fools indeed if they saw you as anything less than the prince you are. Senkit encouraged him, laying a hand on his arm. Cuz Dor nodded, but it was clear he was quite uncomfortable to stand in this place. Likewise, Andri was also on edge. The walls might be high and the ceiling distant, but she was still down underground, where the walls closed in on her. There was no moon here, no stars, no light. As she walked on she continually checked behind her, hearing the phantom clacks of demonic claws stalking her from her past. She was paler than usual in the Mitchell Blade's light, and began to sweat, though it was not overly warm. Her amethyst eyes were wide, and her movements sharp, like a hunted deer. Farron reached out a talent to try to comfort her but she pulled back, drawing up her bow and aiming for the dragonborn's throat before she realized what she was doing and put the bow down. Peace, Andri. It is only me. He reassured her, but his assurances fell on deaf ears. Andri moved forwards, taking up a place near Senkit as Peregrine fell back to watch the rear with Farron. After what felt like almost an hour of walking, they came to a junction. It was strange, as this was the first room they had found since they entered the hole through the window. This only confirmed their suspicions that that window was a false weak point, made to bait intruders into a trap that they might be cut down. The junction was circular, built around an old well that had long since dried up. It had four entrances, including the one that the party had entered through. They stopped there for a moment to rest as Kasdor examined the other paths. How do you know where you're going? I've lost all sense of direction in this place. Eort asked as he chewed a piece of jerky. Practice. Kaz answered as he looked around. He placed his ear to the stone, smelled the air from each pathway. All three were stale, but that was to be expected, for the gate was shut. One of these led to the great gate, and the hall that was surely behind it, of that he was certain. One would likely continue around the outside, as a sort of connecting line between the outer defenses. One would probably lead to the housing for guests, or perhaps some form of guardhouse. The problem was he had no idea which one would lead where. Dwarven holds did not simply carve straight passageways, but ones that wound and twist in through the stone, ever so subtly so that you would not recognize it. The last path had felt straight, but it was certainly curved, as a straight path would have come out upon the caldera by now. He turned back to the entrance he had come through and smiled. It had been a trap after all, but the worst of the trap had not sprung. The whole of the last dozen or so feet of the passage ceiling was a single great slab. If it were somehow dislodged, it would crush any who stood in its way, and seal the passage irrevocably. The passage could then be flooded with the deadly fumes or scorching air from the caldera, and with as long as it was, it would be able to catch a substantial part of any army. As he paused to admire the ruthlessness and cunning of the trap, he heard a faint sound come up out of the well. Everyone else heard it too. Then they heard it again. Like stone tapping against stone, faintly but surely. That it was again, louder now, closer now. Something was coming up out of the well. Andri turned paler as she could hear further tapping, like metal on stone, coming from two other entrances. Getting closer. They were far off for the moment, and they were slow, but they were getting closer, and they were many. The party quickly regathered themselves and formed into a battle line. Whatever was coming out of the well was closer, so they braced themselves to meet it as the tapping grew closer, seeming to come from the top of the well itself. Then nothing. The tapping continued, coming from the well and slightly outside of it but there was nothing there. No shadows shone in the light of the burning blades, no heat signatures in the grey world a dark vision. The tapping continued for a few moments more, as the paladins looked at the well in confusion. Then it stopped. For a moment the tapping stopped, and the paladins wondered if they all had simply gone mad or if there had been some quirk of the stone or water that caused it. Then it began again, growing closer from out of the well. Eort finally realized what was happening and shouted the warning. Invisibles. He warned, but the dead heard him too. Before any of the rest of the group could respond, a creature shimmered into existence before them. It was the skeletal remains of a dwarf, which also happened to include a long, grey beard. 
It was held together by the same dark vines that ran throughout the whole hold. It held no weapons, but was instead clad in what looked like mage ice robes. It opened its skull, and screamed. The sound of this scream ripped into the party's mind, sending them reeling and staggering back, grasping at their temples in dazed agony. The midges' escorts broke their own cover as they charged forwards, skeletons of dwarven warriors clad in still sturdy dwarven plate. As they charged, their bodies swelled in size until they were like giants. There were nine of them, counting the midge, and they came on in a wedge that filled the whole room, the first two raising their massive axes high to bring them down on Julian, who was still reeling from the mind blast. But there was one paladin who had seen this coming, and furthermore had experience in dealing with giant foes. He ought. The first undeared greybeard's axe fell down, and hit a sturdy wooden shield. Eort's hazel eyes gleamed dangerously over the lip as he rose from his kneeling position. The hobgoblin had dove in, just reaching Julian in time. This will not stand. He hissed. The giant raised its axe and brought it down again, only to for the axe to be expertly deflected into its comrade's knee. The other swiped with a low horizontal blow, which Eort back flipped over, kicking the blade up and into the first dwarf's face. He landed with dagger and long sword out and lunged at the wounded undeared. His dagger struck a gap between the plates and twisted, popping it open. His long sword came down into the gap and smashed into the dwarf's ribs and the nest of vines within. The vines screamed and bled black, so he took the blade in both hands and brought it down wreathed in lightning. The great dwarf fell back smoking as he ought landed on his feet, catching his dagger in one hand and smoothly swapping it for his shield. Get up! Order on me!" he shouted as the rest of the Dowager came on. The hobgoblin's cry snapped the party back to their senses and they rolled, blocked, and rose to face the threat. The sounds of tapping from the other halls became louder and increased in frequency. They needed to end this before reinforcements could arrive. Senkit fared the best as she rose to her feet. The axe came down and smashed into her pauldrons. If she was still wearing her old armor, that would have been a grievous injury, but Senkit was no longer clad in mere mortal plate. The armor which once adorned an archangel deflected the blow without a scratch, and the infernal paladin charged. She rushed inside the giant's reach and slammed the edge of her shield into the giant's knee. The armor buckled before the divine Aegis and the knee gave way, dropping the dwarf down to her level. Her morning star might not be enchanted, but it was made to crush bone and armor alike, and fulfilled its purpose splendidly upon the dwarven skull. Cause Dor took the blade on his back, the dragon scale cloak he wore shielding him from the worst of the damage. He rose, snarling as he clove into the wrist that held that axe. His own axes bit fiercely, and with three strikes the dwarf's hand fell with a plan and the undeer took a step backwards. Cause Dor did not allow it to retreat for long though. He stepped in, grasping his axes closer to the blade to better hack into the great dwarf's armor. He ripped away a section of its breast plate and struck the dark heart twice. The undeared staggered back under a fountain of black each ore and collapsed with a crash. Farron flew back into the wall with a gash in his side, the mitral flame falling from his hands as he hit the wall. He dived under the giant's next cut taking back his blade, and the white flame shone once more. He carved a glittering arc that tossed aside the dwarf's defenses, then delivered the blessed flamber jay into its chest. There was a boom as the magic of the blade bit into the bones of the undead and disrupted it. The dwarven armor and weapons fell empty to the ground, the body utterly destroyed. Peregrine received only a glancing blow, but it was still enough to clear most of the skin and the near from the side of his head. He staggered back, blind in one eye from the pain, but the other eye glinted with killing intent. The undead did not know fear, but this one should have. Peregrine moved like lighting up its arm and drove both blades into its eye sockets, fully ablaze. He twisted as he leapt off, tearing the skull free from the body and casting it to the ground where it shattered. The halfling panted heavily as he started to raise a hand to heal his wound, when he noticed the dwarf he had decapitated was still moving, and even turning around. Andri still had her bow in hand as the great dwarf struck. It tore the bow from her hands and the impact took most of the skin off her palms in the process. Unable to grasp her sword, she pulled back and mended her palms. 
The giant came lumbering in again as she took her saber in one hand and her dagger in another. In a single movement, she drew both and cut across in a single fluid blow. The light of the moon shone in the darkened place and it made the blades cut plate like wheat before the scythe. Both blades struck the undead in the stomach, but the saber carried through and severed a giant arm. Andri stepped past to recover her bow as the dwarf fell behind her. Julian rose unsteadily, having taken the worst of the psychic blast. He nodded in thanks to Yort before going for the midge. The other dwarf slammed its axe down between them, and swung outwards. Julian caught the blow on his blade but the impact still sent him back, his boots making a horrid sound as the steel scrapped against the stone. He forced the axe down, eyes burning with wrath. Perish. He demanded of the dead, and struck twice. Each blow was an atom awning, as eye of terror melted steel and bone alike, and the terrible will of Julian's crimson smite sent bone fragments scattering back. The wave of detritus washed over the midge, who tried to parcel out where the nearest paladin was to try and bring it down with another cynic attack. He never got the chance, as he ought emerged out of the dust cloud and severed an arm with a single blow. He brought the blade back up from the downward slash, the speed of it forming a V of steel as he took the midge's other arm. The undead fell back into the well, nearly toppling in, before a dagger emerged from behind the Oort's shield and drove into its forehead. Lightning surged, and the dusty remnants of the midge fell backwards into the quickly collapsing well. The first attack was won, but there were a lot more dead coming. The paladins looked at one another, then at the one path still free of traps and of tapping. They turned to the final passageway and raced down it, into the unknown. Well guys hope you enjoy today's video. We are going to assume you have if you have stayed to the end. Consider subscribing and clicking the notification bell if you really enjoyed it to stay up to speed with any and all new videos. Also check out the links below to our shop for some fat ass titties and our sponsor Rural and be sure to use a promo code at checkout so they know we sent you and you'll get 10% off. And until next time.